Hey, hey, welcome to Page Break. I'm your host, Brian McClellan, coming to you on a frigid fall morning in the mountains of Utah. My guest this week is best-selling epic fantasy author and personal hero of mine, Joe Abercrombie. Joe is known for his nine books in the First Law universe, where he created fan-favorite characters like Glotka and Logan Ninefingers. He has also written the Young Adult Shattered Sea trilogy. Joe and I discuss video games, book tours, our most challenging books, and Joe's background in film editing and what that brought to his writing career. We also talk about the male-centric cast of our debut novels, where that came from, and how we developed as authors afterwards. Enjoy my conversation with Joe Abercrombie. Um, man, so you just had your 12th full-length novel come out, right? I did indeed. Yeah, for my sins. 12th. How, how are you feeling? 12 in. Tired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, fine. I suppose you know they they take, as you I'm sure are well aware, they take a while to write. Yeah. Um. So it's not as though the feeling is massively different to how it was with the tenth or the ninth or after the kind of fifth or sixth or I think the fourth was the one that I found really hard. You know, I had a first trilogy, um, which I'd always had it in mind to write for many years, and then after finishing that, which was a moment that felt like it would never come, right? I kind of had to write something else. And that was the thing that was really difficult, you know, writing a new thing, uh, which I hadn't been thinking about for years with a contract, with some, you know, some level of expectation and people wanting it was just a totally different experience. I found that really tough to deal with initially. Once I got that one out of the way, since then, it's just been kind of work, I think. Just work. (laughs) Just, Just standard nine to five. Just nine or five. How, how, how many are you up to now? You must have done six or seven or more. Yeah, so I've got six full length out, right. like, like kind of a bunch of novellas like what you've done. And uh, and then my seventh is out in June. Right, right. And how are you finding it? I mean, have you, have you found a, a similar thing that, you know, you had that first project you always wanted to do and then, you know, you had to write something new? Was yeah. The same thing for you? Yeah, I think book four was also kind of a big point for me was um because i was you know i i think i think similar to you i think your book four was it was still first law right it was one of the standalones yeah 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 best of cold yeah so uh yeah mine mine was still powder mage but you know kind of a different setting kind of different time period and it honestly just making that little change Mm. and trying to start a new trilogy like i i kept going back to my editor and she just you know she kind of asked me to she she asked me to think about it for a couple of months. And, you know, that's never a good sign. <laughs> Go away and think about what you've done. <laughs> right. And then she goes, uh, and I came back to her after a couple of months and said, yeah, I think I need to rewrite the whole book. And she went, oh, thank God. I didn't want to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> thank God I didn't have to be the one to say. <laughs> right. And, and then I rewrote it. And honestly, like pretty much close to the first draft of the rewrite is what went out. Like it worked out really well. But the that first draft... In fact, I'm finding the first draft, you know, because I just did the first book in a new trilogy, you know, my mm. third trilogy, and I'm finding that first book in a trilogy just tends to be the killer for me. Oh, sure. I mean, and, and similarly for me, even if not the killer, I mean, this last series that I just finished, the first book, I was kind of looking back at, at you know, my progress reports that I do every couple of months, which are useless for anything except occasionally looking back to work out what I was doing when. Yeah. You know, it's quite useful for that. And, uh, I kind of worked out the first book, drafting the first book of those three took about uh, you know, 14, 15 months to get a draft. And uh, then the other two took about a year between them. You know, so I was writing more than twice as fast with the second two as I was with the, with the first. But, you, you know, you, you're trying out the new characters, you're working out the world, you're kind of thinking about what you're doing. And I think once you've got that first one out of the way, then hopefully... You know, it's like it's like climbing the mountain and then you can slide down the other side, right? You can roll down the other side, you can fall. It's not quite so bad. But- or, or at least you've got the scaffolding up, right? Like yeah. you, the construction is ready to do this time rather mm. than all the prep work. Yeah, that's right. The foundations are dug. <laughs> I, I, I've been curious because I've been asking all of the epic fantasy writers that come on this. I've been asking about 
sticking around in the same world. Hold on, you've had other epic fantasy rising. I don't, I don't oh, feel nearly so special now as I, as I did. <laughs> I might storm out. Oh, this, it's. I mean, have I been cheating on you without knowing it? <laughs> this is what I'm wondering. You know, <laughs> outrageous, man. But like, sorry, you were saying. No, it's so epic fantasy authors tend to stick with one world uh, for a long time. You know, not necessarily their whole career. Some of them have their whole career, mm. but a lot of us tend to stick with one world for at least three books. Sometimes, you know, a ton more. I mean, you're on. You know, nine for First Law. Yeah. Um, I did six for Powder Mage. Uh, you know, like like Pete Brett is starting, gosh, is he starting his sixth or seventh in Demon Cycle? Um, you know, like a lot of us tend to just stick around. Yeah. Um, and I was I was kind of curious what your thoughts on that are. Is there, because mm. uh, I, is it is it because it's fun to play in a familiar world? Is it more practical because we've got an established fan base we can extend, expand upon? You know, what What sticks you in First Law? A mixture of things, I think. I mean, for me personally, I suppose there's a kind of, there's a commercial side to it where, you know, you get an established readership for a certain thing. And so there's a certain degree of low-hanging fruit to kind of go back to that and a certain degree of kind of apprehension stepping outside of what you're known for and what you're kind of to some degree liked for. So there's, and then no, publishers are always happy to get a bit more of what they had last time. Whereas they're kind of, if you've had any level of success, they get a bit nervous about having something slightly different. You know, admittedly, it might not be a lot different, but there's always that. The safe options to stick with is roughly what you know. And I think for me personally as well, you know, some writers are clever yeah. and inventive and imaginative and all those good things that start with an I uh, and create amazing worlds, you know, and create alien worlds and worlds that make a point and worlds with incredible magic and that kind of thing. And I don't really do that. I mean, my world's sort of just a stand-in for our world, which prevents me from having to do any diligent research. Yeah. That's essentially the purpose of it. Um, and so... D- diligent research is the worst. Exactly. It's awful. I want to do slapdash research that gives me nice ideas without me having to actually be accurate about anything or, or the possibility of really going wrong. Yeah, nothing deeper than Wikipedia. Yeah, exactly. So I don't, I'm not sure what there is to gain, in a way, by, by tearing up the sets just to make a new load of sets. I mean, I have worked in one other world, and... I'm kind of the new thing I'm working on again is not a first law thing. So, you know, there are other settings that I've that I've dabbled in, but I think I'm not sure for why I would necessarily change the world. And the advantage of it is that you clearly have all this history and this geography and stuff already worked out. And there's all this relevance for the reader. There's all these relationships and these characters that are kind of on the shelf that you can pick up. And suddenly a scene with a couple of secondary characters in it if those were primary characters in a previous book, is full of meaning and relevance and importance, you know, which you can tap into very easily without having to set those things up. So I just love that that feel of an ongoing world that continues to kind of live and where the, the echoes of past events kind of continue to have an effect. So I think it just continues to build ideally on itself. So why not continue to work in it? There, there is for sure some downsides, though. I mean, there's a lot to keep straight and there's a lot to remember. Um, and you also can get bogged down in it. I mean, bogged down in all that stuff you need to pay off. You know, it's a, it's a risk. If you've got all these big characters of the past hanging around, it's easy to kind of get dragged into writing about them again and forgetting what you're supposed to be doing, you know? So you've got to make sure, you've got to try and make sure that you kind of stay focused on where you're going and not where you've come from, if you like. I think that's always a risk. I I've noticed that in in particular, you know, with a lot of writers but in particular your stuff, uh that fan <laughs> relationship gets a little weird because people get like genuinely aggressive with which characters they want yeah. you to bring back and explore more. Do you just have to just like ignore all of that? No, no, I I absolutely do exactly whatever they want at any given moment. That's my approach. <laughs> yeah, you have to totally ignore it, I think. Or you know, you don't totally ignore it. You, you let it settle on you and kind of see if some particles of it osmose through the skin. Um, but you don't take any individual comment very seriously. And I mean, the more aggressive they are, usually the more you ignore them. I think uh, you, you've got to stay true to the vision, if you like. You've got to write what you like, not what they like. And the problem with readers as well, or one of the many, many problems with readers, writing would be a wonderful job if it wasn't for them, right? One of the many problems with them is 
They don't know what they want. <laughs> you know, they say they want a thing, but they don't know. What they, want. <laughs> they didn't know what they want when I, when I wrote a first book, right? Why should they suddenly know now they've got to book nine exactly what they want? And the thing is, if you give them what they got last time, which is what they think they want, yeah. they go, oh, this is boring. This is what I had last time. I want what I had last time, but I want a new thing. A new thing that's kind of like the last thing, but not the last thing, but a new thing. You know, they don't know what they want. You've got to tell them what they want. Or better still, you've got to give them what you want. And it's up to them to decide whether they like it or not. <laughs> but in a way, after that point... It's sort of not your problem anymore. Well, it's your problem, but it's not your responsibility. There's not much you can do about it. Well, and it's funny because like me reading your books, because I've had the experience of reading your books both as like a fan, a young fan, but also as, you know, a professional. Oh, wonderful books. You're a very lucky man. To have <laughs> and so like I look back on that and think, you know, after finishing the first trilogy, like in my head, it's like. Well, of course, Joe's going to bring back Logan Nine Fingers and Glocka, and like that's uh, that. There's no question for the fan reader in me. And then, you know, as a reader or as a writer, I kind of look back at it and go, "Okay, but you know, Joe's got to do what he wants to do, and whether he's got good ideas even for these characters moving forward." I didn't have good ideas the first time, <laughs> <laughs> so why would I have any now? <laughs> I mean, you got to keep low, uh, expectations low, right? Exactly. As low as they possibly can be. That's what my career is all about. Yeah, I, I suppose you have got to do what you want to do, but then rarely do you know exactly what you want to do either. <laughs> you kind of fumble your way there. I suppose my my worry is always that it's very easy to kind of get into a rut of doing the same old thing. We were talking earlier about how, you know, there's this certain commercial pressure to do more of the same. And I think you have to you know, to some degree bow to that and to some degree try always to resist it a bit because it's easy to get into a rut where you'll just come and kind of become a bad pastiche of yourself. And I suppose I could write 52 Logan Nine Fingers novels and probably some people, probably maybe some people would still be buying them. But d does the world need 52 Logan Nine Fingers novels? <laughs> I don't know that it does. You know, I think, and if you write 12 Logan Nine Fingers novels. It's then very hard to make your 13th book a non Logan Nine Fingers book, right? It's really tough. Right, because then it's buried. It's locked in. Exactly. The higher you build the tower, the more painful will be the fall from the top when it finally comes. So I feel like having written a trilogy, you've got to then get out of the box you've made for yourself or it'll be too late. And as you say, I mean, that, that for me was a kind of self contained project that had said roughly what I wanted it to say, I think. It wasn't as though I felt like, oh, now I desperately need to tell this next part of the story for these people. The people kind of serve a purpose in that story, and when it's done, there's just no need to continue flogging the dead horse. I mean, a reader spends a couple of weeks with a book, right? They love those characters, they get into it. If it works, you know, they really enjoy it, but then they end hungry for war, whereas a writer spent five years doing that trilogy or whatever it may be, I mean, you are ready to see the back of that. I don't know. That was my experience anyway. You know, you're, you're not <laughs> desperate to continue with those people that you've spent so much time, you know, finessing the details of. So you've got to do what you find stimulating and exciting and what feels, well, as much as you can anyway. Uh, that's what you're always struggling to get, that kind of spark of excitement. And to me, there's nothing less exciting than embarking on your 52nd Logan Nine Fingers book. <laughs> I mean, what about you? Did you... Did, do you have a totally different cast in your second trilogy or does it have characters in common? Um, yeah. Yeah. Switching between the two powder mage trilogies, it was, you know, I kind of had, uh, you know, it was supposed to be 10 years later on a different continent. And so it, right. it definitely, it was a different cast of point of view characters, but then, you know, one of those point of view characters had been a side character in the first trilogy and, you know, connecting things, you know, having various characters show up as, you know, in some cases, they were genuinely important to the plot. And other times, you know, you mention them as fan service, you know, mm, sure. yeah. um, you know, just, you know, to give the readers a little something that, oh, this character is still alive. They're just doing something else somewhere else. Um, you know, that kind of thing I, I kind of enjoy doing. But yeah, when I switched over to that second trilogy, I, I very much wanted to tell a different story and have it kind of be a different set of characters. Because uh, I think I would have just been maybe bored or or even I would have, you know, kind of tricked myself into overwriting like crazy if I had continued with just everybody that had, you know, started the series. And how did readers react to that then? Were they frustrated with that or were they did they kind of come along with you? You know, I got a bit of pushback, um, but but I think most people came around on it. Um, 
you know, I, one of my, the, the point of view character that kind of pulled, uh, that came out of the first trilogy, uh, was a character that was not a favorite. Um, and in fact, she was reasonably well disliked. Uh, but I, I always liked her from the beginning and had always kind of wanted to do more with her. And so I kind of made it, you know, my, you know, writer goal to make everybody like her by the end of, you know, book four, basically. Um, and, and did that, did that work? I think so. I think I've gotten, I would say pretty universal, uh, you know, kind of love for that book from, you know, the, the base readers. And so I, I think it worked out well. Uh, but you know, it's always a risk with that kind of thing. Cause if I had, you know, kind of introduced this character people didn't like, and then they doubled down on not liking her, mm. then, then I kind of screwed the rest of my trilogy. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, a central character that is not working for one reason or another is obviously a, a pretty, about as big a problem as you can have with a book, both as a reader and as a writer, I guess. I mean, it's interesting you say she is clearly an important word within that context. I mean, I'm guessing you start with quite a male cast, did you? Yeah, my. Uh, in fact, I've I've talked about this a bit more. Um, but uh, Promise of Blood, my very first book, was was almost entirely a male cast, and I was a sausage fest, as they say. Yeah, yeah, it was very much a sausage fest. And I, you know, I've talked about it before that I kind of went into it. I was like 24, I think, and I was terrified of writing a female character wrong. And so I just kind of said, well, then I won't write female characters. And, uh, and that kind of, yeah, I, I, I don't want to say that was worse, uh, but it was, <laughs> but it wasn't better. <laughs> it wasn't better. Yeah. And, and so I, I tried to, to kind of change that as I went along and, um, and it was, you know, it was kind of a fun, you know, like, I don't know. I, I think some people noticed but mostly it just made myself feel a little better about becoming a more balanced writer. Mm. Um, but yeah, like, you know, when it comes to characters and, you know, there's that kind of thing in, in epic fantasy of you do have that kind of, uh, you know, the, the readers that look like me, uh, you know, it's mm -hmm. the you know, mm. bearded white guy who wants to see the sausage fest. They want another, they want another, um, you know, black company, um, you know, mm. that kind of thing. Yeah. And, I mean, it's fine if that's what they want, but I, me as a writer, I don't find that interesting. Um, I'm not even sure if I found it interesting when I was writing my first book, but I kind of went with it because that what felt right at the time. Yeah, and I mean, I think very naturally in your first book, you kind of, you reach for what's closest, right? Yeah. You reach for what you, you're you very familiar with, what feels very comfortable and, and authentic. And if you're a guy who spent, you know, inevitably you probably spent quite a lot of time with other men at one time or another. And you won't have spent an awful lot of time within groups of women, yeah. right? I mean, that is somewhat foreign country. So I think naturally also, of course, a lot of the fantasy you read growing up and a lot of the fantasy that, you know, is kind of a big, the big colossus of the genre like Tolkien and so on, they tend to be very male with very male archetypes and very kind of classic male figures. And so in imitating those things or riffing on those things, inevitably you end up with a lot of male characters again. Yeah, I think it's a... A very very easy and natural thing to do in a sense and you know i followed a pretty similar path to you i started with a very male set of books and then gradually started thinking hmm, this becomes more interesting if half of the population are represented <laughs> right exactly because i understand as much as half the population are female weird it's an incredible statistic yeah isn't it <laughs> but of course there are a few there are always a few who see you know any female presence as a dangerous political statement that must immediately be review bombed. What can you do? Right. And that's, that's so weird to me. I, I just, I guess I, I can't imagine caring. No, I suppose, you know, if you really like something for whatever reason, and it suddenly seems to change in a way you really don't like, that's potentially quite upsetting, I suppose. Right. But I don't know why you would find that small degree of diversity upsetting. I can understand if, you know, I love Joe Abercrombie's Sausage Fest opening trilogy. And then he wrote a book that was just all women. I, I can see why someone might find that a little, you know, jarring. But, I mean, the cast is still mostly male, really. And yet still, just the presence of some women seems off-putting. It's, uh, it's very odd. I can't imagine a female reader ever complaining, bloody hell, there was a man in the book. That would be pretty odd. Right. It's a, it's a, weird, it's a weird kind of perspective to try to get yourself behind um to to understand this sort of 
I don't know. Uh, it, it feels like, I, I think there's some people that are really threatened by this idea of like, um, you know, the kind of the bro space that they grew up in, maybe, you know, of, you know, playing Dungeons and Dragons with your friends and, uh, you know, like, you know, go into the arcade or whatever, um, that there's this kind of like, they feel like it's a safe space. And then once you have gender diversity, it's no longer this kind of bro safe space, which I don't, I actually think that they're probably a little bad for us. <laughs> um, I would, I would concur, but then, you know, I was just thinking, I can imagine feeling that way when I was 12. And I, and I suppose maybe these people are 12. I mean, I don't, I don't know who they are, do you? I mean, you kind of assume perhaps unfairly that they're, you know, grown ups. Maybe they're not. <laughs> maybe they're genuinely not. I don't know. And I, I, I feel, I do kind of sympathize with it because I feel like that was very much teenage me. Um, but, but like you said, that's something that you're, you know, that you kind of hold on to when you're a teenager. But, I mean, I hope I, I like to think I grew out of it. Um, and I, I don't know. I think, I think growing out of things is, is hard for a lot of people, uh, you know, especially in, you know, a big complicated world, but I don't know. It's a weird, it's a weird thing. You know, it's a weird kind of artifact of our little genre and, you know, what we write. And, uh, I, I wonder if it hits, you know, science fiction as much. Or, or or other kind of near genres, you know, horror and that kind of stuff. I mean, horror is probably, not that I'm an expert, but horror seems to have quite a kind of rich tradition of female protagonists and, you know, fi- women being scared by things, if you like. There's often a kind of, you know, woman at the centre of, of horror, isn't there? I mean, I think, as with fantasy, I mean, clearly there are bits of fantasy that always have been much more, you know, female. And then there are bits of sci-fi there's that kind of traditional, you know, um, skip lightning series of military sci-fi books or whatever it may be. There is a very kind of male type of thing. And then there are styles of sci-fi that I guess are much more, have always been much more kind of diverse and varied. Um, there's just different parts. I mean, I suppose these days the nice thing is that fantasy feels like it's, you know, a lot more varied and so many different types of book out there than there were, or it felt like there were when I was growing up when it was really you know dragonlance in in various styles was the vast majority of what was there well that was the vast majority of what i was exposed to i suppose it's also that you know there's so much recommendation out there so many ways to find books now that weren't there when i was a kid when i was a kid you went to the bookshop and you got what was in the window i mean i had no concept of fandom or of the existence of people who might steer you towards more interesting things you know i just i read what was in the window whereas now you know, there's a, a thousand ways to go on a forum or a chat room or on Twitter and, and get, you know, masses of diverse recommendations of one kind or another about anything you should desire. Yeah, I um I kind of had a similar experience where it was, uh, for me, it was the library. That was, you know, whatever they had in stock at the library um, was what I got to read. And so I don't think I even really had a librarian who was like a fantasy reader that was directing me. I literally just, you know, walked to the aisle and that was it. So it's it's kind of, you know, how we get exposed to what we read, I think is actually a really interesting question. And and yeah, and and now it's just you're bombarded on our, all sides by options, you know, a million different things that you could pick up, you know. You know, sometimes I think, oh man, I missed out on the comics bandwagon. And, you know, it just wasn't a thing in my childhood. Mm, yeah, me too. But I go to look at it now as an adult and I go, wow, that is way too intimidating. Like the whole amount of backlog and, you know, what you could be reading. It's just too much. I miss that boat. I just don't really understand it. Yeah. Comics. I mean, there's a couple of things I've read. Like I read Watchmen, you know, because everyone does, don't they? But uh, generally speaking, it's always been a bit of a closed book to me, the whole comics thing. Yeah, same. And it's, it, I, I'm fascinated by the people who absolutely adore everything comics. Um, and I, I think it is a cool fandom. Um, but yeah, like I said, it just outside of my kind of realm of experience. And, uh, and it's weird how it, how those things cross over into, you know, kind of what we do and the people we talk to online and, you know, the conventions we go to all of that stuff, it all, we all kind of get mashed together, even though we're very different. Yeah. And I mean, individual authors are very different and come from very different backgrounds, different ages. You know, some people start when they're 60, some people start when they're 20. And, you know, you can have a, a 30 year old who spent 12 years in the game and a, a 70 year old who just published their first book. It's always quite a, 
interesting meeting up with other writers and, and gauging their experience. I mean, where you come from as well is very different. The US is clearly, you know, a very different market, a much bigger and more kind of varied and, you know, more a market of extremes, perhaps much more than the UK is where things are much smaller and more homogenous. You know, you can go on tour here and visit 10 places in a week, um, just get in the train between the two. Whereas in the States, you've got to fly to very, very different parts of the country to kind of get any any sense of the whole. Um, I mean, do book tours still happen out there? Or is that really, I mean, I suppose with COVID, obviously it's not been happening nearly so much, but I get the sense it's sort of dying off a little bit, the the traditional book tour. You know, it's weird. I, I, I genuinely don't know. I, I've been in this weird place in my career where I, I've sold very consistently for eight years now, uh, but I've never hit a times list. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't have the kind of the, the, um, uh, the density of readers to make it worth doing like a book tour. You need to get some denser readers. I've always, that, that's my, the density in my readership is the, <laughs> is the key. <laughs> so, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I assume with big authors, you know, like, uh, I assume like Brandon Sanderson still goes on a ma- major tour, you know, John Scalzi, those kind of people. I assume that they still do it, but, but I don't know about kind of, you know, the, the lower rung of bestsellers or the higher rung of midlisters. I, you know, coming out of COVID, I probably going to change that a lot. Yeah. And I mean, online events have obviously become, you know, suddenly a much more realistic prospect because that was the only option and people were forced to kind of see how it works. And they're great in the sense that, you know, you can do one of those and people from Australia or Zimbabwe or anywhere can, you know, drop in and see what's going on. Whereas, you know, if you could do an event in Swansea, as I did a week or two ago, then, you know, you'll get some people from Swansea, fingers crossed, but you probably won't get people from much further afield yeah. than Swansea. So, you know, there's always a, a pretty firm limit on how many can attend something like that. Do you like doing events? Yeah. But by and large, I do. I mean, there's obviously, when you do one of those kind of intensive tours, which we do in the UK, or, you know, some people do anyway, where you kind of, you know, you get on a train in the morning, you go to Leicester, Waterstones, you sign some books for a queue of people at lunchtime, and then you go to, you get the train to Nottingham, Waterstones, and you do a talk in the evening and uh, sign some books for people. And then the next day, you do the same thing. You go for, to Leeds and, uh, uh, Newcastle or something in the evening, you know, and then you go to Scotland and you do a couple of events there, and then you come back the other way. And so you're literally doing two a day. I mean, that's quite, it's quite grueling and it's quite kind of draining having the, the game face on, <laughs> you know, the, p- putting on the public persona. Cause I'm a horrible, horrible man, naturally. You know, any, anyone who knows me personally <laughs> will know the effort it takes me to be effervescent and excited <laughs> for people. And so, you know keeping that persona is it's like it's like being the hulk for a week and and never being bruce banner you know you want to you want to have the downtime a little so it's quite it's quite wearing but generally i i really enjoy it i mean it's lovely to actually be in the in the shop with the people for those those that, that moment that you're there looking in the the eyes of the little people you know that's lovely <laughs> it's great to actually see that you know there are readers right that- because it's otherwise quite a a lonely, weird business being a, a writer. You sit there with the screen, you spend a lot of time on your own. You have some input from an editor, but it's not kind of every day by any means. You know, it's very much concentrated at certain parts of the process. So, you know, it often feels like you're kind of just tossing gold down a well. You know, you don't get that sense of... And you get the occasional email and the occasional comment and the occasional tweet and things like that where people are, you know, liking your book or something. But again, that's very much concentrated around release dates and things um so it's lovely to get out there and actually look in the eyes of you know a room full of people who like your books or you know are interested in one way or another um so yeah i do i do enjoy doing it but it's a kind of it's a bit of a balance you you wouldn't want to do too many and i think you know they wouldn't want to see you that often there's a limit to how many times someone's going to come out it's not like oh every saturday i go to a job coffee event (laughs) you know i don't think many people are doing that Maybe every couple of years would be as much as they could stand, I would think. Well, because most of us, most of at least genre writers, uh, fiction writers, uh, we're not public speakers. You know, like, there's there's kind of like this entire, you know, especially in like academia, like people that write books, a lot of them are public speakers. 
Um, and they'll, they'll have a thing that they do for an hour and you, you know, you pay $40 or whatever, go to our auditorium and listen to them. And then when they have a new one out, you're kind of automatically going back because they have a whole thing. But, but most of us kind of genre fiction writers where, mm. you know, some of us will have you know, kind of a speech ready, you know, like maybe we'll do a Q and a, but like, I'm terrible at trying to be ready with something prepared and standing up in front of people. Yeah. And you don't do that. No, that's the killer. That's the that's when it goes wrong. I mean, I remember I did this. Uh, I was invited to, to the Dubai Literary Festival many many years ago, and I went out there and uh, I prepared this lecture basically, and uh, I massively rehearsed it, over rehearsed it, killed any joy or interest in it. And then you know, in a room with like five people in it, most of whom had come in lost, probably. <laughs> it doesn't really doesn't go down too well. I mean, I've discovered over time that the more you kind of play it by ear, the better. Most of what I do now, I mean, if it, if there's a chair, I mean, this last set that I did, they tended to have someone there running it and asking the questions each time, which obviously takes a lot of the the heat out. But in previous times, I've just gone in, I've talked for thirty seconds about the book, I've read a little bit from the book, and then just questions, and then. Actually, the questions are the best part of it. You know, the audience would rather be involved and it gets you talking about something new and it makes it conversational in a way that, you know, prepared stuff is always horrible. I, I never agree to that kind of thing anymore because it's just, it's too much, it's a lot of work because you want to get it right. And if you're a writer, you want, you want anything you deliver to feel really carefully done. You know, you don't want to just say any old rubbish. And so you work too hard on it. You work all, it's like working dough. You know, you work it until it's too gluey and horrible. And then it, there's no joy or excitement in it at all. You're better off just going in and talking to people off the cuff is my experience. But it takes a while to kind of build the confidence to do that, I suppose. Yeah, I, I've found that I'm I, I like trying to do something pre-prepared will kind of cause an anxiety response from me. Mm. But if I just go in and kind of go, hey, how you doing? And just chat with people like that's man it doesn't it, it doesn't bother me too much no and i mean generally with those kind of events they're they're about as sympathetic an audience as you could have anyway you know they've turned up specifically for you you know in your new book or whatever they're people who know what you do who are excited to see you i mean there's a, there's a couple of things i've done where i was kind of you know at more comic con style events where you're just facing an audience of people who don't know you from adam you know and that then becomes a lot more difficult to try and interest and excite people right. who've never heard of you you know, a couple of times I've been, I was at New York Comic Con, I think, and in, in the US, as I'm sure you know, I mean, over here, when you do an event, people come and buy the book and you sign the book for them. In the US, they often give the book away, right? So they'll have a hundred of the of the book and they'll say, come and queue up and he'll sign books and, and they're giving the books away, literally. I was at the in New York, there was this guy in the queue who kept, who kept trying to get me to persuade him to, to take the book, you know, like sell the book to me. The book is free. <laughs> <laughs> Just take the take the book if you want the book, or don't. I'm not going to sit here and kind of twist your arm into taking it. By all means, step aside and let someone else take the free book if you're not convinced. <laughs> but there's always uh, yeah, there's always somebody who wants you to talk them into it, which I find yeah kind of grueling well i i find that kind of grueling even just a normal you know not even when things are giving being given away you know as, especially when it's when it's when it's in person i feel like it's not as bad because if i'm at a booth selling my actually selling my books then yeah i'm ready to talk about it but it's always funny when like there's like a when like a twitter thread blows up with me in it and somebody will just respond to it and say, oh, hey, your books look interesting. You should sell them to me. Tell me what's good about them. And it's like, this is Twitter, man. I am super not interested. No, no. But the nice thing about Twitter is always you, you can just always not answer, right? I mean, just ignore. Yeah. Ignoring stuff is the superpower. But, but then there's part of me that feels a little bad about that. Like, oh, I should be on my game. I should be, you know, I should be the salesman. You know, I should be r hustling. And l like, I kind of... I feel like I've got to kind of find that balance between, you know, yeah, I should be selling the next book, but also, man, I don't really, it's, it's 3 a.m. I don't want to be on right now. Mm. Hey, Page Break listeners, Brian here, rudely interrupting myself for a bit of a plug. Making a podcast isn't free, and I'm hoping that you enjoy it enough to pitch in a pit. To do so, head on over to patreon.com slash pagebreak, where you can toss as little as $3 a month into the tip jar, $5 a month to get the podcast ad-free and early, and $10 a month to hear your name in the credits and feel a smug sense of superiority. 
You can also buy my books from your favorite retailer or direct from my website. Thanks to everyone who contributes. Now back to me. What, um, I, I, are you still playing games a ton? Uh, Yeah, off and on. I mean, I haven't been for a while, partly because there just hasn't been anything around I've really felt compelled to play. Because you're like an old school RTS 4X kind of guy, right? I mean, yeah, uh, a lot. partly I am. I mean, I was very much a Total War guy and a Civilization, and also kind of Baldur's Gate and adventure games of that era. You know, I was very much into those kind of things on PCs. I suppose this is now 20 years ago, God help me, <laughs> more even. And uh, But over time, I kind of realized I can't have that stuff around because I just, you know, if I if I play something like The Last of Us, you might lose 30 or 40 or 50 hours on a game like that. And it's thoroughly enjoyable. And, you know, you spend a couple of weeks playing it quite intensively. And then it's over and you move on. Whereas if you play Total War, <laughs> you spend... 70 80 hours doing one campaign then there's another 100 different ways you can play it and you just you just end up playing it for hours upon hours upon hours hundreds of hours you know and i can't afford to lose that much time down the well i uh, i'm amazed you were able to kind of kick it because i i struggle with video games so much they are like my choice distraction oh yeah yeah i mean and and the problem is the problem as well is with, with something like the last of us you can play it for a couple of hours then you probably get like worn out it's quite kind of grueling that sort of you know intense arcadey sort of game whereas the more click 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 sort of you know strategy games you look up and seven hours have gone past you like you think oh you know i've done a little work session done an hour work in the morning i've got my coffee i'll just you know have 10 minutes because i was right in the middle of something last night when i finally had to go to bed at three in the morning (laughs) i was right in the middle so i'll just finish off that turn yeah and then you look up and it's like seven at night. <laughs> You've got the whole day is down the toilet. And hugely enjoyable though they are. I had this epiphany the other day playing Total War when, you know, when you're playing a, a campaign on it, that seems so important. And then you reach a point where you're like, I don't like this anymore. I'm bored of this. I'll start a new one. I know what would be brilliant would be this other campaign. That would be amazing. So you start that one. And then that becomes incredibly important. But actually... It's just chewing sawdust, isn't it? It never actually goes anywhere. Yeah, there's no result from it. It's not like having a hobby like carpentry or something, you know. It's true. I mean, it's fun and it's it's great in its proper place. But I, I just, as you say, I have a very hard time keeping it in its box. You know, uh, I have a very hard time doing it for an hour. Like I, I'll, I'll watch TV a lot and I can watch an episode of something a day and then I can stop. I don't feel like, uh, very rarely, like with something, I've watched things like The Wire where I was just, I have to watch another episode of this immediately. (laughs) But that's very rare. I mean, whereas the games are just so compulsive that I know if I have a full end, a high end gaming PC in the house, that'll be the end. That will just be the end of my writing career. Yeah. I I finally stopped just a few weeks ago. I finally stopped uh, writing on my like desk gaming PC. Um, And I just take my, uh, I take my surface pro, you know, a little tablet with a keyboard and I just go sit in my car in a parking lot. For like three hours. <laughs> and honestly, I, I'm getting so much more done just because I don't have a game or Twitter or whatever uh, just right there in front of me. Well, the Twitter and the and the news and the various other things that are on the internet are obviously terrible as well. But there's a time sink. I mean, especially uh, around the time a new book comes out. I mean, I don't make a lot of headway with other things because I'm obviously, you know, constantly interested in what's being said and how people are reacting to stuff. So. That's hugely distracting as well. Yeah, it's, you you play a lot of strategy kind of stuff, do you? That's your bag. I I do. I I think I've gotten more into kind of low key survival games. You know, like City Builders. Um, Rimworld is one I've played a ton mm. of. Um, Don't Starve Together. Lots of little indie games that are kind of just stuff that I find on you know Steam and mm. looks interesting, and then suddenly six hundred hours later. Um, <laughs> I realized I had a problem. <laughs> uh, yeah. When you find one that's really well designed, I played a game called Frostpunk. I don't know if you heard of that. Yeah, I, I played through the campaign when it first came out. Yeah, I thought that was a brilliant game. It, it was very much up my street in its general feel and kind of nihilistic stylings. And um, I just got, I don't know if obsessed is the right word, but I it has an absolutely brutal difficulty ceiling, that game. Like some games, you turn the difficulty up high, 
and it's still not that hard. Whereas that game is like on the very hardest difficulty. It is every move has to be absolute perfection. It's so difficult, so difficult and so unforgiving. And so I got very into playing that on the kind of hardest possible difficulty, you know. And you'll play for a couple of days and then it'll go, you know, it'll go wrong. It'll slip from your grasp. I'll have to start again. If only I'd done that on the second day. But that's a a genius game, I think, because it kind of, it constantly shifts the goalposts. So a lot of strategy games, you'll have a very tough opening. Yeah. You know, it's very tough to make, get to the, a certain point. But then once you've become quite dominant, you know, then it becomes quite easy and a bit boring. Yeah. I mean, Civ, Civilization is like the, that's, that's the big problem that game has. Mm, it becomes like dull after a certain point. And also because it gets, you, you inevitably get bigger and bigger. It's kind of fascinating when you've got a tiny little, a tiny little thing where you're really fiddling with the details and getting very into the details. Then you reach this point where you're just clicking stuff wildly because you just can't be bothered anymore clicking stuff through. Brilliant thing about that Frostpunk game is because the temperature's always dropping. You know, what works on Monday, what keeps people alive on Monday, by Thursday, everyone will be dead, you know, because because the temperature keeps dropping. And you can see the, the cold front coming in and then the temperature will suddenly drop. And, you know, everyone in the colder houses will just start dying. And, uh, yeah, suddenly it, it, it hits you with these these terrifying, harsh moments, which uh, is quite unusual in gaming. I was, I was very impressed with that one. Yeah, that forcing you to kind of be dynamic and continuously move rather than marching towards one major goal that once you make that goal, everything's pretty much easy. Um, very different sort of style in terms of gaming. Mm. I, I busted out um, Age of Empires 4 last night, which I think is what brought me around to asking you right. um and it was it was weird because i you know i haven't played in age of empires since i guess i got the remastered version and put a couple hours into age of empires 2 you know years ago but you know it's like gosh those games i think i played the first one <laughs> yeah those games came out so long ago it was weird it was like a little blast from my childhood um and uh it's it's funny to think about kind of as somebody who grew up playing games how games have changed, but also how I've changed as like a somebody who plays them and what, you know, what I find enjoyable mm. and what, you know, is easy, what is hard. Um, you know, like, like I just, I've never, I've played a bunch of them, but I've never gotten into like the really twitchy shooter games. I'm just not good at it. No, I'm not terribly good at it. I mean, I'm certainly not, nowhere near good enough to kind of compete online in the way that a lot of people do now. I just, uh, and I find the whole thing just, the ethos of it is so, aggro and kind of uh, niggly and unpleasant it doesn't it's not fun you know and i think as well when i was at in in my 20s i played a lot of street fighter 2 <laughs> a lot of street fighter 2 and got good enough that you know i felt like a king on that game i felt pretty good on that game so uh, feeling like a king is great feeling like an idiot it's not that great and you've got to put enough time in to to actually be good and, and i can't can't be asked it's just not fun it's not fun <laughs> and you, you've got to have a kind of you've got to have a social group of people that do it you know i was playing street fighter 2 i had a whole set of friends who all played it and we played it against each other you know and that was what was fun about it it wouldn't have been fun playing it on my own for for months on end um and it's a bit like playing chess on your own you know that wouldn't be much fun either and likewise these days i don't really have you know a group of friends around who can easily give up six or seven hours to playing a shooter with me right that doesn't tend to happen very often well and that's the weird part of kind of being somebody who's just just being self-employed in general is that your schedule is totally mutable mm. but then you know you try to hang out with friends you try to arrange stuff and and they've got kids they've got nine to five jobs they've got you know like schedules that are like in concrete and you're like oh yeah i'm uh it's a Tuesday at 4 p.m. and I'm still in my underwear. <laughs> mm, yeah, which is great yeah. in its way, um, but it is easy to forget what day of the week it is, <laughs> definitely. So I, I noticed that your uh, Wikipedia page uh, still lists you as epic fantasy author and film editor. <laughs> yeah, does it? <laughs> I, I, uh, I was amused by that. When is the last time you edited something? Wow. It's a long time ago. Um, well... Funny enough, I do occasionally edit ridiculous videos for sales conferences and things like that. Oh, yeah? That, um, a publisher asked me to do Oh, in order to infuse the sales force, you know, so the videos of, of me being an idiot, basically. So those sort of things I occasionally edit. But to actually anything 
professional, I oh, must be 10 years, I would think, at least, not a bit more than that. Um, yeah, it's been quite a while, quite a while. W- was it a job that you really enjoyed? I suppose if I'd enjoyed it that much, I wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> I'd still be doing that. Um, but it was a job I enjoyed, yeah. I mean, film editor sounds a bit grandiose. I mean, most of what I did, they call it film editing, but most of what I did was documentary, TV stuff, you know. Um, there was a lot of weather porn, as they call it, you know, documentaries about tornadoes with a, a heavy American voiceover. He did not realize that the fastest winds on Earth were about to descend on their trailer home. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. So I did a lot of those early on. And then I did start doing a lot of music stuff. I uh, worked at the Brit Awards for a long time and worked for Iron Maiden for a while doing concerts for them and did a lot of concerts and live shows for all sorts of people. Um, and it was great. It was a great job. But the weird thing about that job is that there's not much career progression in a sense. You know, you get to work on different things. Some people move towards film and that's seen as the kind of high-end thing to do often some people move towards kind of commercials and things like that where there's a lot of money but generally speaking if i was working on one of these tornado shows there might be another editor i was doing that in like my my early 20s and there's another editor next door doing exactly the same job in his late 60s yeah and i think hmm, this is great now i'm not sure i'd want to be doing it in my late 60s you know i'm doing the same thing for 40 years in effect so I kind of felt like I needed to have something else else going on, you know. And also, being an editor is great, and, and you get a certain level of input, and you're quite important in the process, but it's not your thing. You know, you sit there with a the director, and the director tells you what they want, and you might argue a case for why you'd do it a different way, but in the end, they're the boss, you know. And then an executive producer comes in, and they're the director's boss, and then the client comes in, and they're the producer's boss. So in the end, there's a lot of people telling you what to do, you know. And I kind of felt the need to do something where I got to decide what to do for myself, which is why I started writing in a way. But it was good fun, and I learned a huge amount doing it. You know, I learned a huge amount doing it that I think is still very applicable in the in the space of writing as well. A lot of those skills of how you pace the scene and what you focus on and where you kind of move from one thing to another, where you come in and out of the scene, what's necessary to show and what's not, and what can be cut. Yeah. Those are kind of all, to a degree, universal, you know, so... I definitely learned a huge amount doing it. Well, and it's funny that you would say those are universal because, you know, we write in a little genre that is famous for just being bloated. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember even, you know, as, as kind of a young reader, like picking up your first book and thinking, holy crap, like you can pace epic fantasy without massive feast scenes and, and whole digressions and all this stuff. Cause I was coming pretty, pretty much straight from wheel of time when I picked up your books for the first time. And I, with my mid-sized feast scene seemed positively svelte. Right. And modernist, like a Hemingway <laughs> figure. <laughs> well, and it does in some yeah. ways. And it's, yeah. it's kind of funny that you like kind of went from editing into like I said, this little genre that's just famous for being massive. Mm. Uh, I was curious, what is your longest book? Do you know off the top of your head? I think um, I think Best of Cold and Last Argument of Kings are about the same, and I think they're about two hundred and thirty thousand words, something like that. Yeah. And most of my adult books have circled the two hundred thousand word mark. I think uh, the heroes, no, Red Country was maybe one hundred and eighty. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the shortest, I think, of the adult ones. So they vary between 180 and 240. They're roughly, they're pretty much around the same spot. How um how long were the Shattered Sea ones? Half a king's 80, and the other two are maybe 100-ish. Did, so a good, a lot shorter. Did you enjoy writing in the shorter space? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, definitely did. I mean, not that I don't enjoy the longer ones, too. I mean, the longer ones, I think, in a way, are my natural mode yeah i like a big sprawling story i like a lot of variety you know i like to be able to move between voices and have different people and to use you know experiment with different style with the different people and that keeps me interested and kind of excited both as a reader and as a writer i think to experience the different voices within a book and so in a way you know the first law is six characters who are woven together it's six stories woven together half a king is like one but it's like taking one thread out. So in a way, it's if you think that 
the first law's 600,000 words long. Half a king is 90,000. It's really one of those six. It kind of feels similar in a sense, but it's just one thread rather than loads that are interwoven. So it didn't feel like a massively different discipline in that sense. It was kind of just a simpler, much simpler approach, much more pared down. But it was it was enjoyable to try something different, and it was enjoyable to try a new world. I think I'd I'd found that I'd written six books in the first world world by that point, and I felt like I was kind of a bit burned out on that mode and needed to try something else. Needed to kind of you know just experiment with a different voice and a different tone and a and a, a tighter tighter style and see what I could achieve. Because you know as as we were saying, it can be quite a bloated, sprawly sort of genre. And despite writing quite long books, I try to keep them you know, as, as on point as I can and to lose anything that's not necessary. So I felt like I, I, I was interested to see if I could boil it down further, you know, and how, how tight I can make something and it still feel recognisably like an epic fantasy, really. But yours must be similar sort of length, around the 200,000 mark, right? Yeah, I think I think um, most of mine are, are under 200,000. I think Promise of Blood was 165, yeah. um, and that's my shortest. Okay. And then... Uh, my longest so far is the new one coming out in uh, June, and that's uh, in the Shadow of Lightning. Is I think two fifteen, maybe two twenty, um, and that's I think my longest. So you've really hit pretty similar lengths altogether. Yeah, but but like you said, it, it's one of those things where I I always enjoy when I write something shorter because it's fun to have that like you know like just to complete something much quicker in general, you know, less complex, mm. but with the, that length of around, you know, 180 to 200,000 is that kind of feels like my natural, what I like to work in. Yeah. And it's the, the, you know, that multi point of view, you know, like that, that kind of seeing things from multiple characters perspectives is just too much fun, you know, as an author, I think. And it takes time. I mean, you can't do it quickly. You've got a, you can do it quickly, but, to tell the sort of story that I think a fantasy readership expect, it takes some time to kind of bed the characters in, c- get the world going, get the relationships between people going, set stuff up that, that you can then kind of develop and pay off. I mean, it does take time. But then I'm kind of always stunned by how big some series can get because, you know, that always just seems incredible to me that you want to have something so huge and dense and heavy. Yeah. No, that's not really my bag on the whole. Yeah, the massive books. It's funny because I look at things like I like I was I mentioned earlier that I you know came to your books kind of straight from Wheel of Time, and I had mm. I had been as a teenager I was the biggest Wheel of Time fan. I just adored it and I ate it up. And then um, you know when he passed away, and there was kind of that you know period of time where it didn't look like he was going to finish it. I don't think I even read his last one that he wrote. Um, and then Brandon picked it up and, and I just, the idea of going back and rereading what like 11 books was it or 12 books to kind of prep, um, it's just, there, there's a point at which it like, doesn't like my kind of engagement as a reader just kind of falls off. Um, and clearly that's not the case for a lot of readers because, you know, Wheel of Time is massive, you know, bestselling. Um, oh yeah, of course. Absolutely. But it's, I think as well, it kind of came it was the big thing at a time when I wasn't reading a lot of fantasy. So the equivalent stuff for me was probably like David Eddings, Belgariad and um, Dragon Lance yeah. and, and stuff of that nature, which was kind of really and Terry Brooks and people, which was the really big series when I was, you know, growing up and reading a lot of fantasy in the eighties and nineties. So we had a time happened that little bit after that. And so it sort of completely passed me by in a way, because I was kind of doing other things and reading other stuff at the time. Um, so it's sort of always interesting how that is such a, you know, such a, a big thing for a lot of people who are that, you know, got into writing a little bit later than me or a bit younger than me. Whereas for me, it's never had that kind of big relevance so much. Yeah. You know, as something like Dragonlance has, which probably seems faintly kind of silly to a lot of people. But that to me is very important because it's kind of the stuff I read as a teenager when there's always, you know, the stuff you read as a teenager has that somehow that weight and that importance and that relevance that the stuff you read as an adult, even if you, you know, find it a lot better in many ways. It never lands quite so hard or affects you quite so deeply. Right. Right. I actually feel that way about video games too. Mm. (laughs) 
I constantly am kind of on this journey. I, I talked with Pierce Brown a little bit about this on this podcast. I, I feel like I'm constantly on this journey to find kind of to get hit in the same part like of my subconscious that I did when I was a kid. Mm. And I just don't know if it's possible because when you're a kid, it's just everything is new and everything is the coolest thing you've ever seen. And, you know, by the time you've been, you know, gaming, you know, playing these video games for 20, 30 years, it's, it feels like you can't get that, you know, that shock and joy anymore. I have this lame theory though, that it's partly the way that the medium's changed over time as well. You know, when, when I was growing up and playing the first kind of video games, playing Space Invaders, and I mean, one that I remember in particular is Elite. I don't know if you're familiar with Elite. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I am. That's, yeah, I am. Kind of space trading game, right? And um, that came along when I was maybe 9 or 10, 11. And it was just absolutely revolutionary at the time. It was technically far ahead of anything that had been before. It was the first thing to have kind of wireframe graphics, really. Yeah. And it was also the first thing to have this sort of totally freeform you know, goalless world. There was no aim. There was no winning it. It was just, here's a sandbox, do what you like, fly around, trade some stuff, shoot some pirates, you know. And you had to make your own story out of it, really. You know, you would think, oh, you never see the pilot, but you think, who is this guy flying around, you know? And I would start make, spinning elaborate stories about what was going on, you know, and it would imbue all kinds of meaning and stuff onto this world that wasn't really there at all. Yeah. And in a way, they demanded that kind of imaginative effort from the player there's something like the last of us brilliant though it is of course you know and has wonderful voice acting amazing graphics all those things but those all that stuff means you don't need the imagination anymore i mean you experience it like you experience a film it's all there you don't have to ask who's this character how they behave because there they are totally rendered and on screen for you so i think it's lost some of that imaginative aspect that you have when you play something like dice and paper role playing you know where you need to tell the story and develop the story for yourself and so in a way i think what i miss about games like elite from that era is nothing in the game it's what i brought to the game that i don't necessarily need to bring to games anymore so perhaps that's that's part of it i can totally see that i um i i guess i i think that i think i ran into that with kind of the old strategy games um i kind of one of my first gaming experiences was dune 2 do you remember that very, yeah, vaguely. That's a, a kind of um, a bit of a Command and Conquer style thing. Is that right? Yeah, yeah I think I want to say that it came right before Command and Conquer and it was the same developer. It was Westwood. Um, and I remember like, funny enough, like, because my love of Dune as an adult came from that game. It didn't come from the book. It came from the game. And then eventually I read the book and loved it. And, you know, like kind of kept expanding on my fandom in that way. But but it's, it's like Conan for me. Yeah. You know, Conan the Barbarian is huge. And then eventually I read the short stories like, oh, yeah, it's this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is the thing that I love. That's oh, it, it actually came from something else. Uh, and it's it's funny that that there was kind of that even in those kind of very uh, involved, at least for the time, um, you know, I think back on like Warcraft, Orcs and Humans, um, like like it had that same thing where you as the kind of the player had to bring a lot of the background. Like they gave you a little book and you could read a little bit about the world and stuff, but there was so many empty spaces kind of inside that mythos that you could fill in and play with and really enjoy. And like, now I look at, you know, kind of, you know, I look at Warcraft now and it's like, Oh, it's, it's bloated. It became, it became this monstrosity that has so many angles that I can't be bothered to learn. And, yeah. and I kind of regret that because you... I was a massive fan of kind of the early Blizzard, early Warcraft. Uh, I even played WoW for a while. Did you catch the era where, you know, the games would come in a giant box and it it'd often have like a little novella yeah. or a map of some kind? So Elite was the first game to come in a massive box with a novella, right? A novella called The Dark Wheel which I read and was obsessed with because I was obsessed with the game, you know, and obsessed with the idea that you'd have a novella and a game and the whole thing. 20 years later, but 30 years later, probably, I was at a do a publisher thing, and Robert Holdstock was there. I don't know if you're familiar with Mathago Wood. No. Book. Will Fancy Award winner. It's a quite a famous book, very good book, written by this guy, Robert Holdstock, sadly dead now, but um, great writer, British writer. And, but I'd never heard of the book at the time. Never heard of him, never heard of the book. And I was introduced to him. There's like, oh, it's Robert Holdstock. He wrote Mythago Wood. I was like, yeah, whatever. 
And uh, then later on, it, it, it for some reason, I don't even know how it came up, but it transpired he wrote The Dark Wheel, this, this novella that had been shipped to the computer game. And, you know, Mythargo with the World Fantasy Award winner, I was like, yeah, whatever. You wrote The Dark Wheel? <laughs> the novella with Elite? I mean, I was proper starstruck at that moment. Yeah. So I suppose they certainly do have a, an effect down the years, these things. Right. And and it feels like I really I really want to get a um, uh, a video game writer on this podcast because I video game writing is something that fascinates me because it often you see the whole kind of spectrum of, you know, you know, plot or or, or writing being completely unimportant to a video game. Um, to the point where mm. it's it very clearly was just written by the developers as a way to m- move along the plot that they're enjoying, right? Uh, you know, kind of creating. But other times, stitches the development together. Yeah, it was. Uh, but other times, you get kind of these like massively in depth, you know, like kind of kind of like you said, like The Last of Us. You know, the, these these stories that are very self contained. They're they're kind of these journeys, um, and I I find that that's got to be a talent to put all of that stuff together and then create, uh, but, but to work with a, you know, the developers and the people that are actually, you know, coding the game um, to figure out what works and how the story progresses, all that stuff. I'm, I'm very fascinated by all that works, you know, in a different medium from what I work in. Yeah. I mean, and, and one that one enjoys as well. I mean, I think it can be quite a soul destroying thing for, for writers who are drafted in, you know, I know a couple of writers who've done, a fair bit of work in that space. And it, I think every project's massively variable, you know, in, in how much the writer's valued and, and how it all kind of comes together. And as you say, some things are, are quite writer-led and others are much more development-led. I mean, I think I often like kind of open-world, sandboxy sort of games, but clearly the writing, there's a tension between a kind of effective narrative on the one hand and a game where you can kind of do whatever you like. Um, Something like Red Dead Redemption, which I, I love. I mean, the first game particularly, I think, is brilliant. But there's always this problem of, you know, if you have scripted scenes and writing, then that doesn't allow for the input of the player. Yeah, so as soon as you have these these scripted scenes, then they've started to define the character, and then it's hard for the player to play, the, play them a different way, you know, and to do their thing. So you have this weird thing where the Honourable John Marston has a nice interaction with somebody and then runs out and shoots him in the head and ties him to the train tracks and watches a train run over, you know. And that's a bit a bit weird and uncomfortable. Something like The Last of Us can work because it's quite on rails and it, it very much does follow quite a, a limited narrative. There's not that much you can do differently in a way. So it's kind of like a different way of reading a book because there's not a huge amount of, of variety you can do. But then with a game where there's a lot of variety, something more like Skyrim or that kind of thing, it's much harder to knit the kind of narrative elements in then. So you sort of have that choice in a way. Will it be narratively strong or will it be sandboxy and allow a lot of leeway to the player? And both have big advantages, obviously, but attempt they've yet to find a way where, that really knits the two together. Yeah, I, I like you mentioned Skyrim and I like I'm fascinated. By who the heck wrote the the books you find in the Dwemer mines, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you read the first paragraph, and you're like, "No, I'll read this later." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, like these, those like bits of world building that they slot in that you know most players don't even find. You know, like that kind of stuff. I think is a, is a fun way to deal with it in an open world setting like that. Um, yeah, and I mean, there's a mass of content in the in, in those games, isn't there? I mean, as you say, someone's written an awful lot of stuff there. Well, and you have you know companies like companies like Blizzard. You know, we talked about like they you know, they employ people just to keep track of all of the crap that they have put into the games, you know, their, their universe. I imagine it's multiple people have encyclopedic knowledge of everything happening, you know, in this wide universe that they've done. Mm. And I, that the concept of, of a, of a game becoming so big as a story that it has to be kept track of by, you know, particular people. That's crazy. Do you watch uh, Mythic Quest? I don't, know. It's a series about a, about a game developer, a company of game developers, and about a, a, a multiplayer game, you know, that is in development. But it features F. Murray Abraham as this washed-up sci-fi writer. Oh, I love him. Who is the writer for the, for the game, and it's, uh, he has a nebula from, from kind of way back in his career that he keeps, you know, he, he carries around with him to show everyone. It's quite a, a brilliant character, I think, for anyone who actually 
works in the space of sci-fi and fantasy authors it was it was funny do you do you ever kind of have that um you know, maybe existential dread of what you're going to look like as a person and a writer in 20 or 30 years? <laughs> well, I suppose. I mean, not even that. You kind of have the existential dread of whether the next book will be a disaster, right? I mean, it doesn't take very long for the wheels to fall off the wagon as a writer. And, and we all, to a degree, I guess, have some sort of shelf life. I mean, fantasy, probably epic fantasy is one of the most kind of regular gigs you can have in the sense that it takes probably quite a long time to establish yourself as a as an epic fantasy writer, but then you also stick around generally for a long time, you know, once you're there. Whereas, you know, big literary writers will have an enormous multinational hit and then won't be able to sell their their, ne- their, their book after next. You know, they'll be on the trash. So it's it's a pretty tough business. I've, I've heard similar things about YA, uh, middle grade, mm. you know, lots of... I, I think that, you know, when I first got into it, I remember talking to my agent about the whole kind of, you know, the, the waxing and waning of careers. And uh, and she said something very similar, which was epic fantasy in genre fiction is about the most consistent that you can get. Um, that it doesn't, it does not kind of wax and wane in popularity the way that science fiction and dystopian and all of the little kind of other things change. Um, people, at least for the last, you know, what, 40, 50 years or whatever, people have consistently read epic fantasy as just an enjoyment thing. Long may they continue. <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, yeah. Or at least until after I'm dead, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So um, I've kept you forever, uh, so I'm not going to keep pushing on this, uh, but I, uh, I always like to end this by asking everybody, what's the last meal that blew your mind? The last meal? Last thing you ate that you're still thinking about. That blew my mind. The thing that immediately comes to mind is a new Japanese place opened in Bath, so just around the corner from me. And I was doing an event here, funnily enough, in where I live. Um, and we had some time beforehand. And so we were going to go to get something to eat. But there was such a queue outside the place. We went across the road where this Japanese place had opened and thought, oh, God, we'll just try this. It's brilliant. Yeah. Really brilliant. I love good Japanese food. It's fantastic. It's probably my favorite thing favorite thing going really and uh so it's rather lovely to have a good place in town not far from where i live so that was very that was really good actually oh man love that sushi mostly the sashimi yeah oh man love sashimi is 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 japanese big in the uk i mean reasonably so yeah there's a kind of um when i was first working in london so this is probably 25 years ago place called Wagamama had just opened, which is a kind of noodle bar, really. But that was revolutionary at the time for me. It was the first time I'd ever had anything like that. Um, and since then, it's definitely been appearing more. So there's been kind of, I suppose there's always been more gourmet stuff around, but it's become definitely part of the popular consciousness. There's a place, there was a place called Yosuji, which is a kind of very, you know, commercial. There were a lot of those around with a conveyor belt and so on, you know. And then... There's a place called Itsu, which is more of a kind of lunchtime sushi sort of thing. It's become quite a, yeah, it's become definitely part of the range of cuisine that's around. That was epic fantasy author Joe Abercrombie. Thanks again to Joe for coming on to chat. You can find links to Joe's social media and some of his books down in the show notes. You can find me, as always, at brianmcclellan.com. Special thanks to James Sutter for music and Tom Bishop for production. If you'd like to support the podcast, head on over to patreon.com slash pagebreak or buy my books in ebook, paperback, or audio. You can also get signed copies of my books directly from my website. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review. Huge thanks to Kyle Anderson and Patrick Hunt for their backing on Patreon. 